All right. So I thought we would do another example today because we're just on this example thing. And like the good neurotic that I am, I just like to repeat things over and over again forever. So here we are. Uh, we're going to do an example problem today of a a way to measure the speed of a shaft, okay? So we have in this problem, we have a shaft that is moving at some speed we would like to measure um, somewhat straight lines. Um, so what we do is we connect up a little drag cup to it. And the drag cup connects up to a dial of some sort. You could think of a dial as being like a needle, maybe, or some other sort of dial. Um, and then we're going to connect this up to some sort of, obviously, if this is indicating it this direction, we wouldn't want to put the spring right into the person who's going to be looking, so we could put it on the other side. But schematically, we can draw it like this, where we have the spring connected to some, some stationary object. So kind of the operating principle here is that if you have a shaft moving at some speed, it transmits its torque through this drag cup proportional to the speed of the shaft, right? Proportional to the relative speed, actually, between these two sides, but, but proportional to the speed. When this side is not moving at all, then this side's got the, the difference in speed is um, proportional to the torque that gets transmitted through the drag cup. Is this like kind of like speedometer work, like speedometer needle? Yeah, so this is a way to do a speedometer needle. Uh, and then what, on this side, you've got some torque that's happening. Well, the spring will resist that once you wind it up a certain amount, right? So in steady state, once this thing has responded to some new speed, um, it will have some angle of twist that is actually proportional to the uh, speed of the shaft. So there's this input angular velocity, omega s, and the output is the angle of this dial. So we're going to say this is some moment of inertia j. So what we want to know is theta j. What is the twist? The angular displacement of this um, uh, moment of inertia. The spring will give constant k. Um, we'll put a bearing on here, just you know, say that there are a couple bearings, but we'll model it as a single bearing with bearing damping. Well, we'll say the drag cup has damping B1, the bearing has damping B2. And uh, that's a reasonable lumped parameter model of our, of our system. Now, our analysis then is going to need to begin with a linear graph. And I see, you know, we're always going to have a reference velocity here, let's just say that's zero angular velocity. And the shaft that we're measuring the speed of obviously has some angular velocity associated with it. And then uh, we also have this other shaft here and the, the disk. They both have the same angular velocity there. So uh, this, this one's got the moment of inertia on it, right, J. 
Um, this other one's got the input speed, omega s. We should draw a coordinate arrow, and let's do it in this direction, which tells us that via the right-hand rule, for you guys, um, that if we put our thumb in the direction of the arrow and we twist like this, that is going to be positive velocity or positive twist. Um, so if I turn around, it's right for me. So like this and then like that. Okay, so I put it in the direction of the angular velocity source because I wanted it to be our usual situation. When we have the coordinate arrow direction and the source across variable direction in the same direction, we draw the drop to be away from the node of application. And we connect these nodes via the drag cup B1. We'll draw that direction um, in the direction of the coordinate arrow from the omega s node to the j node. And then the j node's got a, a B2, a damper from the bearings, B2. And we have the spring, which also connects to ground. OK. Question? Why are we drawing B2 to ground? Because the two velocities that this thing experiences are the inner velocity of this shaft and a fixed velocity. We usually assume that the bearing is connected to some stationary chassis. Yeah. So whereas the drag cup damper can be in line, uh, the bearing damper is going to connect to ground. Yeah. So the drag cup is connected to the main shaft and not this common all the suspension shafts, right? Exactly, yeah. Because if this drag cup wasn't there, of course, they would be independent of each other. So we, we connect them up, we couple them via this drag cup. Okay. Yeah. Great. So uh, I think it's a pretty reasonable linear graph. I feel good about it. Um, and we can add in the the uh, normal tree now. Our rules are that all the nodes are in there, right? And that our uh, uh, normal tree can't have any loops in it. So we'll continue to add elements in order of priority going down the list until we can't select any more elements without creating a loop. So we have omega s, the cross variable source. Then we have a type energy storage elements, so our j. Uh, and then we can't select either damper, right? B1 would create a loop, B2 would create a loop. And we can't select the T-type because that would also create a loop, so we're done. Question? Um, what is the J value over there? The moment of inertia. Thank you. Yeah. Great. So, switch back. Yeah. So this was our uh, 1A step, right? Our 1B step is to write the list of primary variables. And secondary variables. So our primary variables are across variables on branches, right? So omega s, omega j, 
and then three variables on links. So tk, tb1, tb2. Move this over a little. Secondary variables are through variables on branches, so ts, tj, and across variables on links, omega k, omega b1, omega b2. Great. So, From these, we will select our state variables. State variables. State variables are going to be across variables of A-type branches. So J is an A-type branch, so it's a cross variable is a state variable, and it's omega J. K is a T-type link. So it's through variable is a state variable, tk. What does this tell us the order of the system is? Two. Two. Number of state variables. Very good. Let's do 1d. The vectors. Question. So how do you know it's a state variable? Uh, state variables we select to be across variables on A-type branches. So branches are elements in the normal tree, and A-types are, for rotational mechanical system, they're moments of inertia. So we look for A-types in the normal tree, so in this case we look for moments of inertia in the normal trees and we select the across variable for them to be the state variable. So in this case, it's the angular velocity of j. Just a reminder, what's, the, what's the across variable again? Yeah, across variable is the type of variable that has distinct values across an element. So uh, uh, one, one example would be like if you have a spring, then on one end of the spring you have one velocity and the other end of the spring you have another velocity. Um, whereas the force is going to be going th or through the spring. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the same on both ends of the spring. Current. Yeah, and it's like also like current, so if you're going to have an electrical system, velocity or voltage in this case, voltage is the across variable and you measure it across the element, whereas current runs through the element and that's the through variable. Okay. So the state variables for this are um, the angular velocity and support of J and K? Yeah. Yeah. So you have to look. I mean, it, it, it kind of has like a built-up definition of, of uh, first you have to know what a branch is. And then you got to know what an A-type energy storage element is. Then you got to know what an across variable is. So like you gotta like stack those definitions, which is kind of annoying. But what's nice is that once you get to that end, you have all these definitions. It's a simple statement of how to select it. You just have to go down the list of, and and I, I, this is why I'm doing a lot of examples of this. You can if you practice this, uh, it'll become a lot easier. Pretty soon you aren't gonna have to go back and be like, what's the what's the across variable for rotational systems again? You know, just remember it. Yeah. Because we've spent so much time with the electrical components, mm -hmm. an example that's purely in the electrical realm would probably be a good baby step for us to. Yeah. For maybe the next. The yeah. next so I think the lecture, I think the lecture, the first example I do in the lectures online, is an electrical one. But you don't want numbers for that, don't think. Pardon? Like. Um, I think that one's just setting up the normal tree that's helpful, but like ah. one, of, one of my issues is that I really learn much better by seeing the numbers and seeing the numbers plugged into things to where yeah. if, you, if you show me the end of the book and yeah. go, this is where we're supposed to get, yeah. everything else starts making sense. So like last four lectures have kind of been just nodding along, pretending like I know what I'm doing. 
Yeah, I'm starting to get it now. Good. Good. Yeah, it's it takes some practice. I, I think that just like going through the steps and making sure that you understand all of the terms that are used in each step. And the first time you do these problems, they take a long time to sort of slowly work your way through. And then they get much quicker as you c continue to do them. And I'll do another electrical example. Probably Monday I'll do an electrical example. Um, I, I usually find that the biggest challenge for people is to come up with a mechanical um, linear graph model. That's usually the biggest challenge for folks. And then the rest of it people usually get. So that's why I've done a lot of mechanical examples. Because those are usually more difficult. The, going from the circuit diagram to a, to a linear graph is pretty straightforward for, for folks. But um, yeah, but I'll do, I'll do another electrical example. It'll be fun. So vectors, uh, let's do the state vector. X first, it's just the state variables that we've chosen. So omega j and tk. The input vector, we only have one input in this problem, right? So it's just a one by, it's just a one vector, omega s. And our input, or sorry, our output. The output y, we said we want to know what the angular displacement is of, of j, right? So it's theta j is the output that we want. Remember, we are going to have to try to figure out some way to express that in terms of state variables and inputs. And there is a way in this case to do that. So um, that'll be just fine. So we're ready for elemental equations now, right? So we have passive elements here. We've got J, we've got K, we've got B1, and we've got B2. We can use dots because we don't have currents, right? So omega j dot equals 1 over j tj tk dot equals k omega k uh, tb1 equals b1 omega b1 tb2 equals b2 omega b2 so these are the, the dampers these last two the next is our continuity equation right and we only have We only have one passive branch, so we're only going to have one continuity equation, and it's going to be for J. So if we draw that contour, it intersects just that branch that we need a, a contour for. So we can write the continuity equation for that contour. The easiest way for me is to solve already for the variable that I want, which is tj. So I want tj equals something. So tj equals, so since tj is leaving this contour, then it has to equal everything going into the contour minus everything else that's going out of the contour. So it has to equal tb1 minus tb2 minus t k. Okay. Now I'm going to do something that I think is helpful, but um, is sort of a, a learning tool, a little bit like writing, drawing this table here. Uh, and that is that 
what you start to see is that the continuity equations and the compatibility equations that we're about to write all associate with some element. So um, this continuity equation we wrote for the J element. And we're going to write a compatibility equation for each of these links, each of these passive links. And we did that for the elemental equations too. So this continuity equation is kind of associated with J. Then we're going to write the compatibility equations associated with K, B1, and B2. So I'm actually going to line them across here. So you kind of can make a table, um, which is something that I think is useful to keep track of what you need to do. So you need to write a compatibility equation for K next. And that's one of our links. So if we take that link, K, and we place it into this normal tree for just a moment, that would create a loop here with J, right? J and K would be in a loop. So if we want to solve that for omega K, which is what we're writing this for, omega K equals, what is it equal to? Just omega j. Yeah. So if you go around the loop, if you say you started here and you went down, you would say omega j minus omega k equals zero, or omega k equals omega j. Okay. We can do something similar for b1. So if we plug b1 into the normal tree for just a moment to create a little loop here then we're going to have that omega b1, think of it like a vector, omega b1 has to equal omega s minus omega j. So I'll write that down. Omega b1 equals omega s minus omega j. We're looking at the loop created when we plug B1 in. So if we start at the tail end of B1 and we end up at the head of B1, we know that whatever we do has to equal it, right? So omega s is positive then, plus, and then minus omega j gets us to the head of B1. OK, finally, our B2 compatibility equation is the loop that's created with J here when we plug B2 in. So what is omega B2 equal to? Omega J. Right. Very good. Omega B2 equals omega J. Yeah, so you get the same equation either way you go, which is nice, right? Because if, if it was arbitrary if which direction you chose, then that would, or if it wasn't arbitrary, that would be problematic, right? <laughs> you got a different equation. So yeah, so either way you go around the loop is fine. Yeah. So the way I would do it is I would say, OK, I plug in omega b2. I know that if to go from the tail of B2 to the head of B2, I have to equal B2. So omega B2 equals omega J. And I'm wow, I'm there at the end. So omega J is all I have, all I need. So now what's nice when we use this table form is that when we get to part 2A, where we start to substitute in to each of these elemental equations, one of these compatibility or continuity equations, um, they're, they're already set up for us. So we'll plug the continuity equation for Tj in here. We'll plug the compatibility equation for K in here. We'll plug the uh, compatibility equation for B1 there, and the compatibility equation for B2 there. 
And what we are eliminating here are all of the secondary variables. Okay? All the secondary variables have been solved for in the continuity and compatibility equations. So we're eliminating them from the elemental equations completely, which is a really nice step. So I'll rewrite our J, K, B1, B2. And the first one is omega j dot equals 1 over j. Instead of tj, it's going to be tb1 minus tb2 minus tk. The next one is tk dot equals k omega j, right? Plugging in this compatibility equation. The next one, so this next one here, um, we didn't worry too much about which side of the equation the secondary variable was on, the first uh, 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 primary variable was on in these. It just so happens that the way we've written it, the secondary variables have shown up on the right-hand side of the equation. If that doesn't happen, you can just do a quick little solution for the other variable so you can plug in the one that you need. Um, that's, I usually skip that step and then I, I realize at this point, okay, I should have solved for omega b1 or something like that. But you know that that happens when the variable you're trying to plug in for is not the one that solves, or, or the, is not the one that's on the right hand side. So it becomes very obvious if you didn't do it. We just lucked out in this case. They all happen to be on the right-hand side. So B1, omega B1 is omega S minus omega J, right? And similarly, TB2 is equal to B2 times omega J. Good. That's so much nice. Had the buzzing speakers in my ears. Okay, so very good. We're getting the, we're getting somewhere, right? To B. Now we need to eliminate the remaining variables that are not state variables and input variables to get us to our state equations. How many state equations should we end up with? Two. And the order of the system is two. Therefore, we should end up with two state equations. And we know they're going to come from the J and the K uh, elemental equations, right? The ones with the dots on them. Those are going to be the ones we're going to want. We need to eliminate two variables. Which two variables are they? Yeah, TB1 and TB2. So what's handy, and this doesn't always happen, but it happens frequently enough that, um, that I find myself saying this doesn't always happen frequently, um, <laughs> that uh, we already have a solution for each of those variables here. Um, that's always nice when that happens. So we can rewrite the, the J equation as omega J dot equals... 1 over j times tb1, we've got b1 omega s minus omega j minus instead of tb2, we'll plug in b2 omega j minus tk. Now, omega j shows up twice in this equation it might be worthwhile rewriting with each coefficient because we're going to need that when we write our standard form anyways. So let's save ourselves the trouble in a moment and do it now. So let's find out what the omega j coefficient is first. 
Looking through here, we've got a negative B1 over J, and we've got a negative B2 over J. So that's going to be negative B1 plus B2 over J omega J. And the TK coefficient is negative 1 over J. TK. And our source, omega s, is just plus b1 over j, omega source. So there's that. The other state equation is tk dot equals k, and it, it's omega j. Do we need to do anything with that? No, omega j is already a state variable, right? So that one's done. We have our two state equations. And we're ready for part c, where we write them in standard form. x dot equals a matrix x plus the b matrix u. That's our standard form. So our x dot is omega j dot t k dot equals the a matrix has got to be n by n, it's got to be two by two, just like Noah's animals. That was a Bible joke. I got it. Good. Uh, two, and then our C mate. Oh, so our, our state vector is omega j t k. And then uh, C matrix has got to be two by one, right? Because we have a one vector as our input vector, omega s. So we fill in the first row here from the omega j dot equation, which says omega j dot equals something omega j, right? So the omega j coefficient is negative b1 plus b2 over j plus the tk coefficient, which is what? So this guy right here went there. So what's the tk coefficient? Negative 1 over j. This guy came right there. And then uh, the omega s coefficient. B1 over j. Great. Now the second row, tk dot equals, what's the omega j coefficient? k. What's the TK coefficient? Zero. What about the omega S coefficient? Also zero. Very good. We have our state equation in standard form. So we have our A and our B matrices. Question. Why again do we really care about standard form? Like why is it once you've defined your A matrix like this, uh, I'll show you guys how to solve analytically for any A matrix and any B matrix. So instead of having to figure out what your second order ODE is from this and then solve it in a sort of ad hoc way, uh, there will be one solution for all of the state space uh, form uh, equations. So we're going to use this form to solve it in general, always, for A and B. So we're just going to keep the, this is an A-type variable, this is a B-type variable in the linear model, and then take that all the way through? So or, there were two sort of ideas in there. The A and the B matrix are what we just defined here, or what, what we just applied here, or found here. Uh, and then there are the A-type energy storage elements and T-type energy storage elements. 
But uh, these matrices, we'll, we'll use them to do a general solution for this equation. So this equation has a solution where we're going to be able to write down the state variables as a function of time equals something that includes the A matrix and the B matrix in it. And so we'll do that solution for every A matrix and for every B matrix. So once you get it into that A matrix, B matrix form, you know what your solution is. So you don't have to go through the whole derivation every time. Okay. Another nice thing about it is that we're going to be able to take those A and B and C and D matrices and plug them into MATLAB. MATLAB knows a lot of stuff about these A, B, C, and D matrices. And it'll allow us to plug those in and then uh, do simulations pretty much immediately. Like one line of code and you get simulations coming out. So pretty sweet. So state space form is a very powerful system model form. Um, yeah. OK, so D is to find the output in terms of state variables and input variables, we said that our output is theta j. Now, looking back up here, we know that theta j has got to be equal to theta k, right? They have the same angular velocity. They're also going to have the same position. So that's nice. Um, What's especially nice about it is that we can back out from this relationship. So we'll use this relationship here. Tk equals its angular Hooke's law, right? k theta k. Hooke's law for a linear spring is t or is force equals kx, right? So for the rotational case, it's t equals k theta. And so if you know what the torque is in the spring, you can find out what the angular displacement is across it. 1 over k tk. tk is one of our state variables. So we can say that this is just 1 over k tk and we're ready for that standard form. So this is a little bit of a trick because theta is not one of our variables that we use, right? It's an integrated angular velocity, which is one of our power flow variables. But there were no thetas that showed up in here before, right? They're all omegas. So I used a theta and I found it from, from the torque. And you can find the angular displacement from the torque anytime you have a spring. Okay? You can also find the linear displacement from the force through a spring using Hooke's law again. So it's a nice, it's a nice thing to use when you want to know a, a displacement at the end of the problem. And what you have are, are torques and angular velocities, or in the case of linear, of, of uh, uh, straight line systems, translational systems, you've got uh, force and displacement, linear displacement. It only works when we have a spring. It only works when we have a spring because we have that Hooke's law thing, right? Hooke's law is what allows us. To do this. And Without that, then we, we wouldn't be able to write that equation down. So that's a nice way to do that. If you don't have a spring and you want displacement, what you pretty much have to do is take the, ang or the angular velocity or the velocity as your output and then integrate that, which is fine. But it's nice when you can access it directly through the, the torque or the force through a spring. Did you be able to use uh, arc to, to find it? That are not in this model? Uh, in this model, I mean, we don't really have information about arc length here. We, we're, mostly, we're, just, we're just thinking about um, the rotation. Yeah, it's all, all we have access to is the rotation. 
So yeah, so this is what we've got, uh, which is nice, which is nice. Uh, which gives us our last step to E, which is to write our output in terms of state variables with the C matrix multiplying the state variable vector plus the D matrix multiplying the inputs. So we have our output being theta j, which is going to be an indicator of the speed that we're going, right? Equal to, it's got to be a 1 by 2 because we're multiplying the x vector, right? So this is omega j, tk, plus, it's got to be a 1 by 1. D matrix because it's a uh, one output and one input, which is omega s. So we just need to write this formula down here. So we have our one over k, which will come down to be that coefficient here, one over k. Zero omega j, zero omega s, and we've got our C and our D matrices. So that was that. It's pretty fun. So what, I mean, that what that means is that so uh, you could do analysis on this now. You could find out what the calibration curve is, for instance, between omega s and uh, so the input angular velocity and the output displacement. So you could solve for omega j and tk through time, which I'll show you how to do later. And uh, you could plug them in here. Uh, you could also do a steady state analysis and find out what they are when omega j and tk are constant. Setting this side of the equation equal to zero, solving for the steady state solution for omega j and tk. It's pretty trivial. Got to do a matrix inverse, but it's not terrible. Uh, and then you've got your solution for omega j and tk in steady state. It'll tell you what omega j is. That type of thing is really useful. You could come up with a calibration curve essentially that says, okay, when you're at an angle of 30 degrees, you're going at this angular velocity. You know, 30 degrees corresponds to 500 RPM. Um, so yeah. That's a little, a little speedometer example problem. Rotational uh, uh, state space modeling, linear graph modeling problem. I'll, I think this recording works, so I'll upload this one. I mean, I really hope the recording works. Mm -hmm.